Last Pint Productions presents the New Way podcast. The New Way contains adult content, and new episodes are released most Wednesdays. So back off, man. We're professionals. Listener discretion is advised. So you were in Vietnam, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah. Were you in the shit? Yeah, I was in the shit. Last night, Darth Vader came down from Planet Vulcan and told me that if I didn't take Lorraine out, that he'd melt my brain. Here's how you get him. He pulls a knife, you pull a gun. He sends one of yours to the hospital, you send one of his to the morgue. We came, we saw, we kicked its ass. Everybody wants to be naked and famous. Everybody wants to be just like me, I'm naked. Will you help teach me about this? What is it? A new way. Hello and welcome once again to the New Way Podcast, where we break down pop culture so you don't have to. I'm your host, Matt Shank. I see Ben just mouthing along with me over there so sarcastically. How are you doing, Ben? I'm fine. I'm full of piss and vinegar, apparently, already. Uh, and we are joined by a third in the studio right now, Miss JB Overwing. How are you doing, JB? Hello, I am JB Overwing. And and there was supposed to be a fourth tonight, but there was. But she's some... a loser. <laughs> Where's the womp, womp, womp? It uh, yeah, there was a strange miscommunication. No, no, with... no. I just want to make it really clear. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Matt. I try to be good with the microphone mm-hmm. and wait until there's silence and then I talk. Do it. I'm going to go ahead and interrupt. Okay. You sent Elizabeth and I a text message saying, hey, would you guys like to pod on Friday? Blah, 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 blah. And I said yes. I guess Elizabeth never said anything. Well, phonetically, how do you spell la 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 la? Yeah, <laughs> just the B L A. Oh, okay. right. And then she texted us tonight when I got to Matt's house, saying I didn't think I was invited, it, which is interesting because you invited both of us. Yeah, it, it, I, I just, I really do. I love the world. Uh, there's a world out there where I'm such an asshole that I I invite other people to do things on a on a three person chat. Right. Instead of just saying, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna one on one text this person. Mm-hmm. No, I'm gonna talk to three of you and I'm only gonna be addressing one of you to invite you for a really fun night hey, to do the podcast. Can I, can I share a story really quick? Absolutely. Because this is so funny that just happened just now, uh, before <laughs> I came over here. So Matt and I are in a group that we like to um, lovingly call the Pickle Posse and or a Corn Dog Crew. Yes. Um, I like Pickle Posse. <clears throat> yes. That's good. Right. Um, it, it's six people, literally. That's it. And so my daughters are aware that we are having a get-together tomorrow um, uh, in December of our, our little group for a gift exchange. And uh, our Uncle Paul, Mamalino, was over at our house and the girls were like, are you part of the Pingle Posse? Are you here for the party tomorrow? Aww. And Paul looks at me with like puppy dog eyes like, Oh, no. Oh, and I'm like, and Beth and I are just like, fuck. <laughs> friend, friend of the podcast, Paul Mamalino. That's awkward. Um, That's awkward. One of the only men to cry on the podcast. That's, I mean, well, I mean, no, he's, no. he's welcome to come. Well, sure. I, I, mean, I mean, well, so. now, I mean, I mean, now, now, yeah, now, we, now we feel like he's like should be part I, of. I, the I, otherwise, he's uh, gonna cry again. I don't think he's pickly enough. <laughs> Listen, if anyone represents a pickle, but, it's Paul. But it's one of those situations where it's like, on your, if you're on group text and just be like, yeah, I, I, I think that person's invited, but yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, my son. Da- I'm, I'm looking at our daughters like you fucking bitches. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> Put us on blast. Also, also, I am highly, highly concerned. Uh, so, anytime I go over to hang with the Wilsons, uh, and and we last night we got to hang and That's go see Ben's family, see ben. Beetlejuice, and we we will discuss the Beetlejuice in a moment. But the girls are very phone obsessed, and they sometimes have access to mom and dad's phones, which makes me very terrified because they will start scrolling through chats looking for things. And she's, and so Luna's like, oh, I know about the pickle posse. And I, and I go, you're not in, you are not in those chats. For, there are not, there are things not appropriate for you in the pickle posse. Please do stop sc- scrolling on these things. Makes me very concerned. They, they also do, I, that's also why I will not let them near my phone because they will point it at my face to unlock it 
and then run away with it. Yep. And uh, yeah, that's not that good. Doesn't yeah, know, the, the next time I'm around them, I will keep the phone. Out oh, of reach. well, they, they go after my watch now. Like, I just in make the middle sure, of the show, they will start grabbing the watch. I, I just make sure to immediately delete anything that's like. You know, questionable. Could be questionable. But yeah. see, I I live alone and I'm an adult, and so I don't think to do those things <laughs> before I go to your house. So I go, okay, this might not be appropriate, and and typically it's not anything uh, uh, lascivious uh, on my no, own no, part. It's shit that we have oh. shared with each other, but it's still gross. <laughs> sure, that's the line. That, that's why Luna opened that thing up and was like, mm, Luna. <laughs> Oh Lord, uh-uh. that's terrible. Uh, so yeah, we did. We did last night for Ben's birthday. We went to go see Beetlejuice the musical uh, at the Kravis Center. I I quite enjoyed it. it. From so if we cover it from a standpoint of the new way, kind of talking about pop culture, Ben, what are your thoughts just on the show as a whole? Um, really interesting construction because it's not so married to the source material, which I love, yet it makes the set pieces a little too tied to mm. the source material considering how far they, they stray away from it. Yes. Um, but altogether, it's a riot. It's so yeah. much fun. And the music's great, and there's lots of fun numbers, and, the choreo- and there are cool effects, and it's funny as shit. Yeah. Now, were you guys seeing like a national tour of it? Yes. Oh, cool. Yeah, and and the girl apparently like um she just graduated high school like a year ago or something at a DC. Uh, oh, how she's great phenomenal. For uh, like Wonderful. she's all- <laughs> she's living the dream, JB. First national <laughs> First tour, tour right out of high school. Wow. Don't, don't be jealous. She's like a couple of young, years younger than you. It's true. This is true. She's seventy three. I did. I did tell the. I did tell the girls that because uh, they were. I go. Oh, you know, JB was in a first national tour. And like, what is that? I go. Two, well, this this two is two. I'm so sorry. Two Thank first you. national tours, uh, tours of duty, as I understand it. But uh, yeah, they were very impressed to know that you were in a production similar to what this. I it, this is. I mean, technically, what they're putting together with the show is really, really impressive. I love the ensemble. Gets a lot of really, really good bits to work with, um, which is uh, really a wide breadth of, yes. of roles. Of the ensemble. I mean, the ensemble has to do like nine wardrobe changes. Yeah, they're all um, over the place, and they're all—they're really all over the place, and they do a lot of different stuff, which is very fun. Yeah, I think I, this, the second act it, it hurts a little bit. I think yeah. it, it's a—it's the I would have moved maybe like the the Deo song to the second act. Um, I'm uh, al- but- eliminating. Uh, actually, eliminate the Deo. But, I, li- uh, I, I liked. I liked. I liked okay. Deo. I thought it was weird that they kept. Trying to put in the the shake Sonora, but they didn't actually put it in the show. It's just it's like hinted at, and then it's in it's a bow song and not like it's it, not the end. It's like very 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 end. But I it's I felt like I thought there was gonna be something more for that, like something bigger for it. But uh, I did I liked it. I and I was t- telling Ben, and Ben had the same response as I did. Like it is it is the most Matt role that maybe exists in all of musical uh-huh. theater, and that it is. Patty, I'm dead serious. I hope that. It, sincerely, I hope that works out for you at some point. I really hope you get the chance to even audition. For I think it. by the time they are able to figure out how to like financially do it at these smaller theaters, I will have aged out of the role. But uh, but it, I'll still do it for karaoke and shit. It's fun. It's a but it is a it's a killer role. Just it's all comic timing on it, and it's it is kind of interesting though. They so one of the things that they do very differently from the movie is that it, Beetlejuice is only in the actual movie, the original movie, for like fifteen. 20 minutes or something like it's some ridiculous small amount of screen time that that michael keaton's actually on there versus the stage show it is very much you know a, a central character but he does but they does defer the final bow to lydia for the show which i thought was kind of interesting she <laughs> she is ostensibly the star and they even did that on broadway when it was alex brightman who is arguably the biggest name in the show um but uh yeah it's kind of interesting i mean she has the biggest numbers and, and the biggest Moments, I would say. I have to ask JB that you you gave a reaction there. I'm curious when I said the name Alex Brightman. <laughs> I, okay. <laughs> I I don't, I know Alex. Okay. Okay. I won't. I won't. I mean, he maybe is, another podcast. He is a really cool guy, and he's really freaking talented. And I just happen to be like best friends with the woman who broke his heart into a million pieces. Oh so, my goodness! Oh, wow. Yeah. So I saw. Something hey, really wait, sad wait, wait, happened wait. for him. It was Benny Mockley, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> 917. We, t- 
<laughs> we do. We do. By the way, it, so we are we are running a contest right now uh, for who is New Way's biggest super fan, and we have a grand prize. So amazing! You're, you're like, hold on to your hats right I now. I promise. I promise it. JB is yep. going to give you Betty Buckley's private cell phone number. I sure will. Now we haven't made kind of any necessary rules for this contest yet. We just need someone out there to prove. They are the, the New Way's fan. biggest fan. Maybe it's a tattoo that says nerd rope motherfucker. Maybe it is... Maybe um, you bring new <laughs> listeners to the show. Maybe you're, <laughs> oh my God, JB's actually doing work for us. To Maybe you increase people. the listenership. Yeah, double our listeners, which <laughs> should not be hard. It's a tattoo of Benny Buckley's phone number. <laughs> It says Betty Fuckley, and that way we can get away with it. We didn't say your actual name. We used a pseudonym, so who would know it's you? Nobody. <laughs> Nobody. Not a, no one on the side. And who, how do you guys know if that's her actual phone number? I mean, when she answers, you'll know, but, <laughs> but you know. Um, I did want to introduce something into this podcast. We have done this before, um, and I always forget what they are, but um, in 2018... Christmas of 2018, we had a, a giant, maybe the biggest podcast we've ever done for Ben's birthday. It was it was his birthday and our Christmas show, and I we actually hosted the podcast live during a Christmas during party. party. Yeah. And we just had people awesome. from the party cycling in. It was that like a two so and a half smart. hour uh, uh, show. It was amazing. Yeah, I, I was wearing like a one piece Christmas birthday <laughs> suit, just like Guy awesome. Fieri on crack. Like, uh, uh, it, was like Christmas. it was unreal. I was on like two hours of sleep in ten days. It was funny. But I love that you had different people just come in. And, oh, yeah. and we we, we yeah. would literally just. I had someone kind of randomly going out to the party and bringing people in once so like someone smart. was done. We had Nick. Nick couldn't be here, so Nick pre-recorded a whole bit where he was. Crawling through the vents, vents diehard yeah. style, and we kept having him call in to us as, as he did it. But one of the the gimmicks that I did on that episode is I downloaded um, eight Christmas random sound effects, and I don't know what they are, and I didn't then, and I would just randomly play them throughout the podcast, not knowing what the sound effect is going to be. So I thought that would be fun once again to do this. We we've heard these at some point before, but I don't think you remember five, six years ago, uh, whatever those songs were. So I'm going to play the first one right now. And every so often throughout the podcast, we'll go ahead and play one of these. So this is this is number one. I don't know what it is. And it doesn't want to play. Merry Christmas. Okay, mm. well, that's it. I mm. don't know. It's very... Cre- and also, I don't know where I downloaded these. Because that just sounds like someone on there, like, taking a poop and recording this as a voice memo. Merry as, Christmas. I feel as though that's from a movie. Merry Christmas. Maybe? I don't know. Uh, but we'll, we'll keep doing those. But, uh, okay. but while we are also on the sound effect uh, train here, uh, it, those of you that listened to the last podcast know that we, uh, for the first time in a long time, we found a clip that we absolutely wanted to pull and play on the podcast. And we wanted to resurrect a bit we have not done in... A while. In years, I think, at this point. Uh, and JB, this this bit predates probably when you started listening to the podcast, and I think for a lot of our friends. So I am going to include the entire intro on this. We have an intro that is longer than the bit itself. Um, but we realized years ago that if you are playing the podcast on your iPhone, you can change the speed at which the podcast plays. You sure can. And if you play this, play it at half speed, it makes us sound like we're hammered. Um, and it, so it, we are also we more have, hammered. Yes, I was you, just gonna say we have never been actually drunk on the podcast. It's always just been that we we're slowing it. To, it's you. You you had the problem. It was not us. But um, Nick had a moment on the podcast last time that seemed fitting for this. So we are reintroducing our bit called the slurred sophisticate. And here we go. Welcome to another edition of The Slurred Sophisticate, where we slow down portions of a podcast you probably didn't listen to in order to make it funnier. (laughs) Today's lethargic podcast replay will have even the most patient listener clamoring for death's sweet release. As the gentlemen from Last Pint (laughs) argue about what movies are comedies and what movies are in fact not comedies. (laughs) comedies. <laughs> Edge of your seat material right here, faithful fans. So, without further ado, please enjoy the slurred sophisticate. 
And uh, there, there is a new uh, comedy special on Netflix. Uh, not Matt Come Wright. On, I can't. Uh, but this guy, uh, Stavros. Uh, Stavros uh, something. This is Greek guy. Um. Did you and say his name is Stavros? I gotta Google his name. It's Stavros. Stavros. Halkius. Halkius. Okay. Oh, I know um, this guy. He's good. You well, sent me some of his stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, he, he, he would come up on my my TikTok feed all the time because he's from Baltimore, and and that's why it would show up on my on my FYP, right? <laughs> um, but I started. What are you, wait, did I miss something? <laughs> no, it's just this. <laughs> 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 oh, 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 oh. This has been another rousing edition of the Slurred Sophisticate. <coughs> Join us next time for more shenanigans. <laughs> one of our, maybe one of my favorite slurred sophisticates I have Can ever I put. I miss <laughs> yeah, Nick's, Nick's like, what is I miss Why something? Are, are you mad at dead. me? <laughs> dead. Dead. I'm dead. You guys, seriously? I'm um, <laughs> tears rolling down my cheeks. <laughs> Jamie was having a, a hard time keeping that shit together. <laughs> I was trying to save on my laugh because I didn't want my laugh to get mixed with Matt's. <laughs> <laughs> and now I have this thing, you guys. I, <coughs> you guys think you have problems. I have this thing called bronchiatosis, and it makes me if I have vodka. Not saying that I have, but just as, if I have. <laughs> um, um, Full disclosure, not saying I have. It I've makes, had vodka. and especially if I laugh when I've had vodka, mm -hmm. it makes me have some sort of asthma. And so you're going to hear me like <coughs> a lot, and I apologize for that. It's not uh, fun. It's, it's good timing, JB. By the way, our sponsor today is Grey Goose Vodka. Grey Goose actually sent us a free bottle of vodka today that we are sampling on here. Goes down smooth, doesn't make you cough Goes at down all. Smooth. Uh, Grey Goose Vodka. Thank no you so breathing, much for that one. No breathing problems at uh, all. And now I'd like to introduce our second uh, uh, sponsor, Tino's Vodka. <laughs> Tino's Vodka. <laughs> and Maine. And, and no, so that's why I was doing the smoker's lap. I was like, <laughs> that's a little embarrassing. Uh, it's wonderful. Listen, we're, we're all full of weird that's sounds fine. here on the new way. It, it happens to the best of us. You guys, that shit is funny. <laughs> Matt, you <laughs> that laugh, and I'm going to rhyme something. <laughs> oh my god, that was good. Stavros. <laughs> Uh, ben, ben and I were like it was so there are a few times those of you that that have not been in the studio for the podcast I'm typically looking through uh, uh I'm looking at a screen so I can see who else is in the room even when it's usually when it, it's Ben and me but there are times where Ben and I are laughing or we can something where I lean back <laughs> to like make actual <laughs> eye contact and, and Matt and I make eye contact and, and we as soon as Nick said, said that was <laughs> ah we, we both realized we were like like stifling a thing and I was like what's happening yeah. it was so good I was like what is going on here? well there if you hear weird wheezing <laughs> during that listeners that was that was my bronchiectosis I, there's also oh, a, a me weird wheezing in that clip as well but uh, yeah if you would like to listen to the actual clip in its entirety it's about 20 minutes into the last episode where we fix franchises um, you guys that is mad <laughs> funny so, I, so I, I had prepared a couple of things here um, I may we may do this game. I don't know. The game kind of was shitty, but it but it made me laugh a little bit. Well, but, great, bring it on. But before the game, so um, 
fans of the new way know that we we often do a segment on here, another segment that is a recurring segment called erotic readings. Now we normally only do that when Ryan is here, uh, mainly Hi, because Ryan. he gets so upset having to read things like I think last year it was coconut wet. Uh, which really made him uncomfortable. No, 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 no. It didn't make him uncomfortable. It made Nick uncomfortable because <laughs> Ryan read Coconut Wet, and I think that Nick still hasn't made, uh, made really a, a, <laughs> a, 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 like amends with the way that that, that was read. So I, I had it in my mind because uh, we were supposed to have uh, both JB and Elizabeth. And I go, we, we, this is the year that we have brought a little bit more in, in addition to Beth and just Beth. I think Beth is the only female contributor really we have had over the years on The New Way. Uh, now that we have a little bit more female representation, why not do an erotic reading with the ladies? And so I went down my normal... <laughs> Terrible, terrible. Unfortunately, so I, Elizabeth doesn't understand text messages. No, she doesn't. Um, but also, unfortunately, so I have a I have a whole process of googling that is. I have to be very careful as I go looking for these funny, uh, terrible erotic readings. And today, I stumbled on a site that I, basically broke me for about a half hour and made it so I was unable to pull any sections of things because it was it. It blew my mind so much, but I do want to read a couple of uh, things from it just so you understand why I don't. I didn't have an erotic reading, but I am going to read a, a snippet from one of them. But right. I stumbled on a site called Literotica, and Literotica has a a whole section for just Christmas stories, which they put in. They put Christmas in quotes, uh, which is funny. Um, and so I'm I'm reading through, and they give you a, a title. No, not Xmas stories. No, no, which would seem to be much more what you would be doing. But right, um, right, so you right, get a yeah. you get a title, and you get a log line. So they start off innocuous. Christmas spirit comes this year. The log line: the spirit of Christmas enchants a couple on Christmas Eve. Okay. That's a little on the nose. That's that's fine, right? We have uh, this one's called "It's a Wonderful Voicemail," a feature length cinematic Christmas smut audio. Okay, fine. Then, then it takes a hard left, which is this is the first thing that broke me. This one's called Christmas Bells in New York, and the log line is cat sitting leads to face sitting with my manager's mom. And I go, okay, so we have we have turned very quickly here. And I, I start going through some of these. Um, they're uh, lecherous lunch with Vanessa, Vanessa's tabletop striptease, <laughs> with more to follow. Uh, that's their log line. This one was a fantastic one for, for you married couples out there. I, Matt was, was like, I'm starting going through this with no interest outside of research for the podcast. And then it was an hour later, and I felt really great. Um, no, this was this one's amazing. So sorry, Elizabeth is missing <laughs> I, this. I, I was really hoping she would be able to read some of this, but uh, we had this one's called The Special Gift on Christmas Eve, and the log line is, Christmas Eve, and the first time a young couple enjoy anal. Uh, which is one of those great Christmas That's gifts magical. that you give to someone. That's it's magical. Christmas magic. But one in particular caught my eye above and beyond all the rest. Um, first of all, phenomenal title. The title is A Cock Under the Christmas Tree. Uh, as you do. As you do. And then the log line is, <laughs> prepare yourselves. A trans man gets a silicone dick for Christmas and fucks Santa. Same <laughs> and Same. I said, click. <laughs> it was okay. the only one that I said, I need to know more. I would like, let's, it's reading Rainbow. Take a look. It's in a book. So I'm going to read you just the beginning of, of, of A Cock Under the Christmas Tree. Oh, no. Now, I also did not understand until far too late. This apparently is part two of another tale well, on here. Duh, man. But I it mean, but it was it seemed like they were telling a story. Well, I, I mean obviously I'm to have the principle where the trans man <laughs> asked for the neck. You don't just start part it's, one with the cock under the no, tree. No, 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 no. It's part two is where the dick just listen. All right. So I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna do my best to do to do Ryan here, okay? After Santa fulfilled my fan this is the beginning. This is how it starts. After Santa, Part two. Santa fulfilled my fantasy of receiving the hottest spanking of my life for being on the naughty list, I wanted to see what would happen now that I was on the nice list. Christmas Eve, I performed at the holiday-themed drag show and then went to an after-party with my fellow kings. I made sure to snag some cookies to leave out for Santa when I went home. I got home just before the stroke of midnight. 
Right after I put the cookies on the decorative, I thought I did the same thing. They don't even mention it. They don't even draw a reference to Stroke of Midnight. But stroke. God damn it. It's so upsetting. Shout out Stroke. So, right after I put the cookies on a decorative plate, I heard a knock at my door. There stood Santa in all his red-suited glory, cheeks flushed from the cold. His rugged red Jeez. beard was dotted with frost, but his smile was warm enough to melt my Frosty himself. He says, Santa says, I come bearing gifts. I'd have slid down your chimney, but that's a bit hard to do in a grad student dorm. So that was my first uh, uh, moment of this uh, I did not like. Uh, that, that was number one for you. That huh? was number one. Okay. Then the, this person responds, I can't wait to see what you're going to leave under my tree, or should I say under my bush. I smirked at the reference to my front hole, in parentheses, I'm a trans man. Shut up. Continuing. Careful. Keep making bad puns like that, young man, and you'll wind up back on the naughty list. Same. <laughs> Person responds, well, we can't have that. I mock, gasped, clutching invisible pearls. Come in out of the cold and have some cocoa and cookies. My southern mother would murder me if she knew I left Santa standing in the snow. <laughs> now, we're about to get to the, the moment here. Uh, so this is recounting, apparently, the first thing. At our first tryst, I was pulled over Santa's knee the second we confirmed my safe word. This time, however, Santa sauntered over to my couch and made himself comfortable while nursing a cocoa. <laughs> this part is community theater written all over it. To, surprise, to my surprise, he never broke character, although we chatted for an hour. Against all reason, I wondered if jolly old St. Nick himself downloaded Grinder, or if the Hallmark Channel was making a foray into queer hookup apps. Santa regaled me with stories of mischievous elves, orgies hosted by Mrs. Claus, in bondage involving garland and colored lights. Mrs. Claus is a babe. I, in turn, shared the latest drag drama and which of my fellow grad students were sleeping with their lab partners. After an hour of laughing at sentient snowmen pegging each other with carrots, pegging. Santa put down his gingerbread cookie and mug. And here we get to it. Come sit on Santa's lap and tell me what you'd like for Christmas this yeah. year. Curious as to where this would lead, I did just that. I've been dreaming of a new silicone dick. Well, the elves specialize in making the finest detachable cocks. They what do. color they suits do. your family? Was I really getting the chance to fuck Santa? Yep. Never one to look a gift horse in the mouth, I responded, eggplant colored, of course. A double-ended one, please. Thicker than a tube of wrapping paper and with enough vibrating power to power that sleigh of yours. And that's where we're going to leave it. I think we don't need to know really where this goes after this, but someone spent... A long time building out this two-part story of getting their new silicone dick from a fake... The, the thing that is most concerning to me is that this is a fake Santa. <laughs> this is... Like, they're really carrying on with this thing. It's it's very bizarre to me. But anyway... No, no, no. no. Here's the thing. <laughs> Uh-oh. This is... Detachable oh. penis. Detachable <laughs> penis. <laughs> um... King this Mr. is the real Santa, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> red, red beard. <coughs> he sat on the couch. He sat on the couch for an hour and had hot cocoa, <laughs> and talked about nothing. No, no references to ass spanking. No, no references to I, anal. No, he he. Well, apparently, he's, he said it was recalling of um of like uh, stories of orgies, stories orgies with Mrs. Claus and mischievous. Right, elves. but that's just Christmas magic. That stuff. <laughs> that's just typical. <laughs> if he wasn't the real Santa, he wouldn't have been able to regale those stories. So I think I think you're wrong, Matt. I think this was the real guy. He, he also wouldn't have been able to exist in a place in time that didn't exist outside of time. Absolutely mm. not. Have him to spend that and time he wouldn't have been able Christmas. to survive all that time out in the snow where the guy just left him asking him questions. Because <laughs> questions. he was thinking about getting a detachable penis You know what I mean? Yeah. But if he had like real Santa boots on, he could stand out in the snow all the time he needed. You know what? Yeah, I think we'll we'll continue on further episodes of New Way to delve into uh, this. This one was written by Braddy Bottom. Not uh, not fully confident why you shared this with Ben and I. I don't really see that I correlates just, to anything. I, I thought it was hysterical. Uh, uh, I also, I to me, I, I in my head, I was just picturing some like community theater actor that was doing a, I, like crit, like a Santa character I, on stage, and this was his like his like homework. Like you need to go and like. What would Santa be doing if he was alive in these times? And this guy's like, all right, I'm going to go get on Grinder. I think mean, the season of sharing. 
This is okay. True. Okay, I I'll go with that. That that was you, Matt. You were sharing, and this is the season. I you know what I tried, and and I think we're due for another random Christmas sound effect. Uh, okay. Now that we're going to share, so let's hear mm-hmm. what we have. Happy holidays! Wow, okay. these Happy are holidays. hard. These are I don't know what these are, but they're Maddie. Are these posts. from pornos? <laughs> <laughs> They're all from Lit Erotica. Because <laughs> that guy was like, happy holidays. Like he's, That's exactly know. what Santa said in that last story. <laughs> There, there are like there are random quotes in the story that just like it would pop like there's a line in that says would it give you dysphoria if I returned the favor it's just I'm I'm amazed dysphoria by this. I That's know hot. so let so I we will return to literatica at some point uh, not on this podcast but on a, on another podcast okay okay um uh, Elizabeth I did I'm sorry Elizabeth no I <laughs> Elizabeth wasn't invited I did I well it's because we're, we're, we will not be able to talk about Diana the musical because Elizabeth is not here but I had to sit through that shit I can talk about it. <laughs> It's awful. It's Good real awful. God. Um, uh, but JB, you watched Elizabeth the musical, like the the no, Di- no Diana the, the, the musical. Yeah, the, Elizabeth the, made us watch it, and it's the die the the Princess Die musical. Oh, she should be awful. here. Very she should awful. be here to answer for it. She but should Matt didn't to invite her. her. I, it's, but I was going to ask you, JB, you watched uh, Leave the World Behind, correct? No. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. The I, Julia I want to know if you give us a review of that. Actually, that has to do with my my th- theme, the your theme tonight. Oh, so do you want to? No, no. You can wait for it. I, I was uh, curious to hear your take on it. I've not seen it. I, but keep, I, ha- I keep hearing that goes, about it. That goes with the the theme okay. of the potty. We'll get we'll get to it then and there. You watched okay. it, Ben? Yeah. It was it good? Um. Hmm. It's good. Yeah. Okay. I would say it's good. All right. Yeah, was, yeah, yeah. It didn't change my life. Okay. But, but it's I, all right. Yeah. Good. That's fair. Yep. That's fair. And we've already talked about Betty Buckley's phone number. Ben, you had a couple things maybe you want to get to before we started the eight, podcast four, th- in full. In- <laughs> Did you want to go over anything first? Um, I didn't want to mention that. Um, man, uh, it, it was mentioned a couple episodes ago, I think, but SNL has been yeah. fucking. Killing this has season. it really absolutely it's one of the best seasons they have no had. No kidding, I am. I seriously, I'm gonna tune in because I gave up on them a long time ago. The 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 Che and Colin swapping jokes, which is a favorite of Ben and mine, yeah. is I think the best they have ever done this year. And Che's gimmick for oh, it I'm is so, so fucking that. funny. Yeah. Um, but which yeah, we don't want to ruin for anybody. Anybody's no, the the say. hosts like the hosts have just also been stepping up each episode. Which I, I I think the hosts have been chosen very deliberately. Yeah. Um, but because uh, the hosts are all in on everything, and the things that don't work still kind of work because yeah. everyone's a hundred percent. So, and that new cast member they have that can sing her ass off is yeah. fucking killing it. So uh, I'm saying SNL this year, highly recommend. Who knows? Yeah, great, great Christmas so episode. You guys on this podcast, I kind of like. First of all, it's fun to watch you and Ben because you guys are just so like have been doing this for so long and you're so casual and on each other's wavelength. But I like how you just oh, we were like that before we started the podcast. No, 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 this is no. True. I believe that. But I think it's kind of cool how you guys, even before you get to whatever the theme is of the podcast, that you guys just share your thoughts about is that current pop culture is that the idea like yeah we, yeah we try to like whatever is going on kind of that we've been consuming in pop culture or just chit chat it, it, it's funny to me because uh, it's one of the things i really love but also hate about smartless and and fans agree with this 100 percent. they they talk about it all the time mm-hmm. the first five minutes of smartless is this it's just them riffing with each other there's no there's no agenda there's no whatever it's just mm-hmm. them talking about their days and it's oftentimes the funniest or most interesting part fully, of the podcast fully, yeah. and and I would I would absolutely listen to a ninety minute version of Smartless where the first half hour was this and then they spent an hour on the topic. Just them shooting the yeah, shit. Like yeah, like I because I think that's interesting and and if the people are in, in, not even if they're interesting, if just whatever they're bringing up is something that you might want to listen to or eavesdrop on. We we it it's very nice to hear from people that they like this part of it. Sometimes we're like, oh, this was unlistenable. Like we or just sat and talked long. about nothing yeah. for. 45 minutes. Like, right. That's why I'm going to, like, I'm ditching right now this, I, I like, I have a terrible game idea. Okay. And it's, and it wasn't going to be good anyway. And it's like, that, that's a crutch bit that I'm like, if we didn't have anything fun to talk about and we we're running out of it, I'd put that on. Okay. Um, but that's kind of what we 
try to do but we also fuck up and make boring content i'm sure it's no no i like it. i like to hear you guys latest your latest thoughts about what's going on you know as far as snl or whatever yeah i have i'm not i i have not so i will in the next two weeks consume like 10 times as much pop culture as i normally do just because these shows have Tara? taken so long <laughs> yeah like yeah i'll be out in, in texas in the middle of nowhere and i will be forced to do nothing but watch things um and and finish running lines for a show but it's like yeah this is i'm i have a list on my phone of like 30 things to watch out in bandera because it's like Sweet. that's what i'm gonna do Sweet. Um, all right, so Ben, you came up with the topic for this podcast. Cool topic. So uh, why don't you give us a little lead into it, and then then we'll talk about how we like molded it into something different. Uh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's typically well, how it goes. Uh, I mean, it, it, it came on a, a um, kind of a, a thought of self reflection because I thought about um, I have been into film and television. Well, mostly film and then into television later. Um, since I was a really, really young child. And I have properties, movies, television shows, um, uh, other pieces of pop media that I have been either really into or really uh, despondent or very, you know, um, very negative about locally uh, throughout my you know, I, I went. I went to film school. I was a pretentious film school <laughs> fucking <laughs> asshole. And um, a no, lot. But you are very. You, Matt was saying earlier, you are very artistic minded. You, uh, you are. Uh, so it's fair enough for you to have like extreme opinions about. But a, a lot of those takes, I feel, were very not accurate. I feel like they were not fair. Um, and, and I feel like a lot of things I thought. At certain points, I would would change things in ways that didn't or didn't contextualize things in the way that they necessarily sure. should have been. Um, and whether that a, a lot of times that was my own personal experience that I was bringing to it, and that's the reason I didn't like something or I I didn't love something. But I think everyone has that one thing where they're like, "I hate that," and then later in life they're like, "I love that." And so that was what I want to talk about was yeah. why what are those things and why yeah. why are those yeah. things? Yeah. No, and I, I really like it. We we talked about it. This can go both ways. It could be something that you you held on to for a long time that you were fighting to say this is good, this is good, this is good, and then eventually you you realize maybe this isn't great and maybe I, I don't want to die on this hill uh, of defending this this property. And I agree, Ben, that I think the most interesting part of this is what is that when and how does that switch yeah. flip for things? Um, and what you describe is is so similar to me <laughs> except that I had no film school. I was just watching Kevin Smith and Steven Spielberg do things at a certain time in my life where I was like, oh, I am I understand real film. And then I would just get pissy about other things or or sometimes something would be too artistic for my tastes. And I would instantly rebel against it and be like, yeah, it sucks. Or I heard someone say something about it. <coughs> Slacker. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I still, I'm not going to, listen, no, I, 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 no, I, no, I have no. to revisit. No, no, we're not going to argue there about is, that. There is one on my list, though, that is a famed one of my my brother and I used to argue about forever. And you urged me to rewatch it in about 2013. And I did, and I completely flipped my mind about it. All right. Well, I'm interested in hearing about that one. So uh, we, I can start it with that one if you'd like. Yeah, actually. I'm... So, um, Are we going to tell our Christmas stories? Oh, my God. I uh, forgot about the Christmas anecdotes. Okay. Do you want to do that saying. first? I'm just saying. Yeah, we got time. We've got time. Do we? Yes. Okay. I to- I'm so- I literally I had it on well, here, and I just on the Christmas thing. It. Okay, yeah, yeah, let's yeah. end up. Perfect. Good idea. Yeah. Great idea. I'm with you, especially because you just said it. Really good. <laughs> well, also, this keeps people listening. If I'm like, oh, I was about to tell something really good. And <laughs> um, no, so um, there's a when I so listeners of the podcast and Ben especially knows that like my my film school was watching Kevin Smith movies and my like the the two movies that made me obsessed with what film could do were like completely polar opposite movies. It was Clerks and Saving Private Ryan. There were the two, one movie was, oh my God, I could maybe do something like this and it's amazing. And the other was, holy shit, I was so 
upset and and confused and didn't know how to feel about watching the the experience of watching this fucking crazy movie. So around that same time, there's another filmmaker gaining some prominence whose first movie I loved, which was Boogie Nights, and whose follow-up film was a little bit polarizing, which is a movie called Magnolia, which is by Paul Thomas Anderson. God, that movie sucks. <laughs> so JB is where I was for many, many years. And my brother loved Magnolia, and I hated Magnolia. Now, and Kevin Smith. And Kevin and, and very Magnolia. famously Kevin oh, Smith really? hated Magnolia, which is probably a large part of why I hated Magnolia. But I remember Oh what, no, also cuz it sucked. <laughs> so I had I had me. I had legitimate issues with it, but I also remember even when I said it, I didn't like it, I would always talk about there were moments of that movie that I loved. I think Tom Cruise's performance is fucking great in that movie. I think Philip Seymour Hoffman's performance is great in that movie. I think John C. Riley's great in that movie. I did not care for watching Julianne Moore cry for like 15 minutes at a time over and over again. So I, I was very conflicted with it, and Ben and I, when we first met and started talking movies, we would Magnolia would come up every so often, and I'm and I of course like at that point I hadn't watched it in ten years, and I was just like it fucking sucks, Magnolia sucks. And Ben's like it doesn't suck. I go it sucks. It's a fucking garbage movie. It's a ter- It's like overindulgent. He had no editor. He was allowed to do whatever he wanted. He needed an editor in the movie. We went on this back. So Ben urged Wrong. me to Ben urged me to rewatch the movie and I rewatched the movie and I gained a better appreciation for it. I don't I'm not going to say I 180'd on it entirely. The things that I loved originally, I loved even more, but I did gain an appreciation for more of what he was doing with plotting and pacing in the film, but um but yeah, I really I definitely turned a corner on a movie that I used to flame any chance I could get. Well, and so Jamie still doesn't like that movie, which is Shows you it's a polarizing movie. It shows you that you and I are wrong. <laughs> my favorite, my favorite part is when Penelope Cruz says to Tom Cruise, "You've got to get no, wait, it." No, wait, wait, wait. That's Vanilla, Vanilla Sky. Sky, which is a We're terrible movie. Oh God, you guys! I'm thinking of Vanilla Sky. Well, first of all, you are correct. Vanilla Sky it's is hot garbage. <laughs> wow, I'm so sorry. No, I apologize. Magnolia. Magnolia is, is a long. The frogs a rain movie. down on the cars at the With end of William the movie. William H Macy and oh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. I liked that. <laughs> uh, okay. okay. <laughs> I take it all back. That I, was a fine movie. I'm so glad you did that Julianne dead-on Moore. impersonation of, of Penelope Cruz. So we knew get which it, they fuck together. <laughs> Every time she... Oh, my God. I wanted to fucking shout from the movie theater when I heard her say that. You got to get it, they fuck together. I was like, that's what you all need to do involved in this movie. But it's been a little sky, not Magnolia. <laughs> Vanilla Sky is... Now Cameron Crowe is second to Manny Buckley on our <laughs> shit. Cameron Crowe, Betty Buckley. I wish I knew Cameron Crowe's phone number. I mean... I would give it up. The love-hate, though, that we have for Cameron Crowe is is pretty impressive, but that is easily his worst... By, God by, damn By and far, the worst thing far, he's ever put his name on to. Sorry, that's not the, the yeah. point. The no. point is Matt came around. <laughs> and I, and ah. I saw we bought a zoo. <laughs> <laughs> That's his worst movie. I will. I would if I was on a desert island. I could only watch one thing, and it was between I Bought a Zoo and uh, Vanilla Sky. It the strain. It would be the strain. No, <laughs> no <laughs> then I would just kill myself. That no. would be terrible. It would be a strain not to kill yourself. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Benny. What, what's on? What's on your list here? What do you have? Oh, um. Well, hold on. I'm actually psyched to hear Ben's. I I have a few actually. Now um, now can I can I interrupt you by saying that sure. is it okay if not that these are my examples but is it okay if the thing didn't age well? And yes. So- well, so actually that was <laughs> sorry that was a point I was going to make. Okay. Um, I think a lot of us have love for people or for properties or for other things that age poorly or or that. Or cancelable. Exactly. Totally. Or, it's hard to see you like Kevin Spacey yeah. in something now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we have 218 uh, episodes of Kevin oh, Spacey. Uh, oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I mean. Ben yeah. wrote a script about Kevin Spacey with, that I helped with. Literally, yeah. <laughs> well, before the podcast. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I, I don't think those things qualify. I think it's things okay, okay. you have more of a, 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 an objective opinion on 
that you change them on. Got it. However, I have a couple yeah. that I think I wouldn't have had that same opinion on even if they hadn't had been gotcha. cancelable. Yep. yep. Which I'll get to in a minute. Okay. But um, I'd say the first one is something that's actually really near and dear to my heart. And something that actually, I mean, it, it's kind of funny how much it shaped my pop culture perception a, a, after um, college. Um, I always had this perception that, first off, Film and television were, there was a huge dichotomy there. Mm-hmm. There was no thing on television that can work on TV, or, or sorry, no, nothing on television that can work on uh, uh, in film, and nothing that can work vice versa. Um, so I loved things that worked within their specific mediums um, all, all, all on both sides. And I became um, obsessed with How I Met Your Mother Mm -hmm. um, in 2006 when that first came out as a sitcom. So um, How I Met Your Mother was a sitcom that ran for eight seasons. It was very popular. And it legitimately reflected the characterizations of all the people I knew. And, um, And a lot of the stories reflect Absolutely, like what I was going through at that time, or whatever. I would have been quoted from 2006 to probably 2009, at least the first three or four seasons of How I Met Your Mother. I'm saying it was the best show on television. I remember this. No, (laughs) it was not. But you weren't alone. No, here's the thing. It's not a bad show. It's a great show for what and was trying to. Um, however, it's disposable. Com- it is completely disposable. And I realized that after later in life going back and rewatching it and just being like, wow, this is pretty fucking vapid. But what you need to explain to me now is how did it, because I never watched it, how did it go from the best show on television to vapid? How, because how I was watching it in real time in 2006. 2007, 2008, when the main characters were my age, right? Oh. And now, I, I go back, and an episode will be on randomly, you know, in syndication. And I'll start watching it and just be like, fuck, this running is bad. It's so bad. It, and you know what? And I don't think it's just that. So there's a really interesting, I'm really, really glad you, you kind of nailed this, because I, I had a really hard time going through my list of trying to find concrete examples of it. This is a great one. Something like Friends is another great one as yeah. well. So it, it's not even just that the, the writing ages poorly. It's also a little bit of us being more aware of what tropes and archetypes and gags are being played for jokes that we laughed at. And I, and I struggle with that still to this day of things like, I grew up on when Bugs Bunny put on a dress, it was funny. Like, guy, guys in drag, to me, still read funny. Like, and when it's done on stage, especially in theater, like, there are still moments and they're in certain shows where it's like, you're doing a farce and you're doing a thing and the guy's got to put on the dress and he comes out and pretends to be a girl. And that's and that's humorous, right? And at least in the context of what's going on in the show. And I think there's a lot of that. But, but there's something that's happening that's worse in How I Met Your Mother that's also really interesting of the times, which is is Ted Mosby, right? And it's it's similar to the Ross Geller character as well. There are all of these nice guy syndrome things we are starting to recognize in these characters that we champion as being like unlucky in love or clumsy or whatever they were. And then you look at their behaviors and you realize how toxic a lot of the things they were doing. Ted, like Ted and, and Ben, you and I talked about this so early on in yeah. our friendship because I Ben recommended the show to me. And I remember watching it on a flight. I was flying home. This is when I was still dating Ben's ex fiance, uh, Christy. And I was watching the show, and the show was so close. It was too close to things going on in my life that I literally told Ben, I can't keep watching this. It's, it, it's, I'm uncomfortable. Like the the moments of humor and things are happening. That character was Chrissy. Yes, I mean very much. And I was very much Ted. Robin Smolders 
And I was Ted, but that doesn't mean that Ted's a good guy either, right? There are things that Ted does and things that he projects onto people that now when you look at it with perspective of how you should act and treat people and how you should treat love and these ideas of putting these people on pedestals and making these goals of like attaining this woman, they're, they're gross. Like it's gross. It doesn't age well. That's exactly why I couldn't get into friends because I was that age. And at that point in my life, I was out of college and I was living in a hole in New York city (laughs) And it made me so angry. Uh, seeing that giant lot. Yeah, the like yeah. I know it's become a joke that like, oh, they lived in that lot. But I was deeply offended by that. I really was. I didn't think it was funny. I And I was deeply offended by how thin the women were and and how they 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 ate on the show. Yeah. And I was like, there's no way these people eat. And, they, you know, that was why I couldn't watch it because it it was my age and it was my life situation and it was so untrue yeah so it's interesting that how i met your mother worked for you because it was your age and it was how how you were going through life at the time well i mean i, I mean how much your mother was still in new york and it was still in a much larger yeah. area that i'm sure that they could again mul- they were in like mul- fucking brownstones like but, but, that's where the cosmos multiple went. people you know, uh, and I'm not saying you should draw, judge a show yeah. by how truthful the living situation no, is. No, I'm no. just saying that bothered me because I was living it at the time. No, yeah. and and I think and I so I think for me it was more about the characterizations of uh, 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 saying, n- n- like this is how a friend group is naturally constructed. These are the oh, reasons. Cool, cool. Yeah. These are the reasons why these people are drawn yeah. together, and uh, that always made sense to me, and. That's what I'm saying. Is later that it, a lot of the writing felt false to me. Cool, I Much get later. it. I get it. Which is, and I think that's also just what you deal with in in sitcoms. Which is funny. So there's a random sitcom that for me has aged really, really well. <clears throat> surprisingly, so and it's a sitcom I always loved. Three's Company, <laughs> of course. Um, Smash. It's, it is. It is. <laughs> it's Smash. Um, no, it, it. What's funny is it's. It was. It's a show that I always, always loved. But it's. It's not one that. Oh, it's on like my top five or top ten. But it's been making a really, really big resurgence on things like TikTok, and I get why. And it's New Girl. Um, and I think New Girl is a yeah. show whose voice, for whatever reason it is, is it it continues to work because it's a lot of people just being on. I see JB is not agreeing is with me on this Is that with Zoe Deschanel? It is yeah. with Zoe Deschanel. Oh, <clears throat> God. No, I, you're thinking of Mumford, the movie Mumford. No, I'm not. No, okay. I'm thinking of Zoe Deschanel is what I'm thinking of. <laughs> um, whether you like Zoe or not, uh, the writing for that show just to me seems it's a lot about insecurities and weird quirks that feel more natural to me at this point in my life. Well, the, the thing that's good about New Girl is that it's not about her. It's yeah. about everybody else Thank in God. the room. And <laughs> and they are all so different because, yeah. honestly, the, the relationship between the guys in the apartment is more fun than Zoe de Chanel. So I would say we need more a- men in represented on TV. We need more men show. representation in these shows. You're right. I think you, that's what makes sense. I mean, you personally know. We don't have enough show. white men represented <laughs> on TV. I do hey, love this. By the way, <laughs> Caleb De Chanel is one of my favorite <laughs> cinematographers of all time. That is her, her dad. sister, De Chanel, I think is wonderful on Bones. Yeah, her, <laughs> lovely. What's her name? Her sister? name is her sister, sister De Chanel. Her sister De Chanel. <laughs> Her name is Moni Moni Deschanel. Shmoey Other one Deschanel. Yeah, that I know you love her so much because you know her name is the other nepo baby of the same of the same. Shit, I can't think of her name. Caleb Deschanel, who also starred in Twin Peaks. So these are she's a fine actress. She's. Do you want to try that name again? Nope. I, right. I, I love Zoe De Chanel. I, I can't. I can't. I love all the De Chanel's, including even though, Sister De Chanel. Even though I know she's probably not a good person, but whatever. I, what is so fun? So this this actually brings up a topic we have 
uh, we have mentioned a few times in the podcast, but is always super fascinating to me. And JB, it, Ben, you have a lot of connections as well, so it is kind of interesting on this. But I'm sure I'm more connected than Ben. This, I think you might be. <laughs> uh, well, and and if we ever get Marcy on the podcast, she can open up to everyone in Comedy Bang Bang and UCB. But this idea that we talk like we're people on a podcast with. 60 listeners an episode and we just talk about people so flippantly and judge them and all these things and then we have someone here's like well i've met that person and i can tell you you're correct or not correct what would you like to know like you're like the magic eight ball i don't know truth. zoe Deschanel. she might be really lovely i really don't i just don't enjoy her you don't like her bangs i get it I, yeah <laughs> i understand all right jb let's hear who you've changed do you have one that you changed your mind on that you didn't like and you've come to like okay. yeah so we just know? No, no, never gonna come around to that. Um, I have two that I'd like to talk about. All right. Um, the second was one that I loved very much, like heartfully as a kid, and grew up to learn the truth about. Hmm. But I'll start with Julia Roberts. Okay. Who um, I was violently against this person being an actor. One hundred percent. I I I'm could so happy not you her understand up. the love for her. First of all, I found her not attractive. Mm -hmm. um, I found her acting to be I am so a lesbian. Wh what? Well, that no, would be no, good. I, 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 no, I said as a lesbian. No. Oh, as a lesbian. Oh, oh, yes, oh, yes, oh. yes. I, I thought you, you said meant and, and a lesbian. That's, that's what, what I heard. I was, I was like, like Jesus, that wouldn't ben. be bad, Ben. Ben, try um, to learn your audience a no, little no, bit. No, 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 I'm with you, Ben. Yes. As a lesbian, <laughs> I did not find her attractive, okay? Nothing about her. Um, saw her in person once in New York City. Not attractive. Didn't get it, okay? But not only that, I, and the only reason I say the not attractive part is because that was such a thing about yeah. her, was that she was so beautiful. But I really like... As someone who was really studying acting at the time that she was coming up with Mystic Pizza and um, uh, Satisfaction. With the enemy. And, no, God, don't even get me started on that. Like, I just didn't find her. Oh, it's Steel Magnolias. I just didn't find her acting, to be honest at all. And she was getting so much praise because she had this great red hair. It was just so annoying that her celebrity was about her hair. And... Um, and so I was annoyed by the time Pretty Women came. Pretty Woman came out. I thought she was fine in it, but I was annoyed. Mm -hmm. And then I gotta tell you, I was watching a little show that I just slammed called Friends, and she had a. She was dating Matthew Perry. Yeah, that she time, had yeah. a she had a short you know episode or whatever, and I was like, well, this is what she should do. She should do this kind of thing because she she was actually did a great job on friends she was she was funny why doesn't she just do this this is all she can do and that was my opinion of her i worked in a gay video store at the time in chicago and her movies were always being rented and we were always asked to show them in the, in the um store and i couldn't keep my mouth shut about how terrible i thought she was and i called her <laughs> names that i won't repeat because i feel guilty and um and then a little movie called aaron brogovich came along and I found this actress who didn't care what her hair looked like and didn't care what clothes she was wearing and was just telling the truth um, and, and listening to the other actors on, on set with her and, and listening to the other actors on camera with her. And, and I was like, damn, if I didn't think she was good in that. And then that comes around to... The movie on Netflix right now that you just said the name of, I forgot. What's it called? Uh, this one is uh, the uh, Leave the World Behind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I found myself when the movie started, I was like, oh, I, I wonder if I'm going to like this movie. I can tell already from the first three minutes it's going to be slow, but but okay, I can deal with a slow movie. Okay, I can tell from the beginning I'm not sure I'm going to like this little girl, but that's okay. But you know what? <laughs> and without even thinking it really, I thought, but at least I know Julia's going to be great. Hmm. And all of a sudden I went, wait a minute, what did I just say? Y you know, it was like I had this trust that there was going to be nothing wrong with that part of the movie. You know, and all of a sudden I realized this woman has learned. I'm not saying that she wasn't good in the past, okay? I'm just saying that my young self didn't like her in the past. But what I am saying is this woman has learned how to act for film. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a real 
skill that not all actors have. And and she knows how the camera works. She knows what her angles are. She knows how to listen and tell the truth with a camera stuck up in her face. And and I can sit back and relax when it's a Julia Roberts movie because I know that that part of the movie is going to be damn honest and damn good. And that's a full turnaround for me on her. A fucking men <laughs> yeah well done yeah you, you bring up you bring up a couple of really really interesting things what the the one that you just mentioned which i i love um and one of the reasons why i i do love listening to smartless uh, as a podcast i like listening to jason bateman use every guest that is in any kind of direction capacity as film school and just continue to learn like because he want he loves directing and he's so obsessed with it that's why he's so good at it and, and he it, keeps it learning is. and he and he talks about um uh ben affleck uh directing the movie they just did um about the uh, uh air the air, air the, the nike yeah. shoes and he goes affleck rolls in and affleck and affleck has done this on the it talks about it in the interview and he's like I, I get with Jason and Matt uh, Matt Damon and Jason Mamie's like I don't have to worry about shit with them he goes they know exactly where the camera is going to move they know exactly how i'm going to move the camera i don't have to have talks with them i don't do anything they are literally moving in the middle of character work to get to where the camera is and i i think there's a level of stardom you reach as an actor if you're something like julia roberts who has worked with every fucking director in the planet <laughs> at some point they it rubs off like well, 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 I, I, I would also like to say mm -mm. that there was a huge point to be made that Aaron Brockovich was the Julia Roberts star turn point yeah. where she became a real actor. In in our opinion. A, in our opinion. Uh, um, mm. S Steven Soderbergh has a lot to fucking do with that. The director has a lot to do with that. Um, and not to like empower like the guy there in that, that situation but if you watch the way that Aaron Eckhart and and um, Julia Roberts interact in that movie, it's nothing like anything she's ever done as a meet cute in any other movie she's ever done in a romantic comedy. No, and it's not. I see you protecting yourself as far as saying right. that Soda Bird was. I, no, it, I, that doesn't I, sound I, sexist. I, I, I'm not trying to mean like. No, no like, it doesn't yeah. sound that way. It doesn't sound that way. It's also if you, you know, it's interesting that you say that with Aaron Eckhart because my reaction was with her with Finney. Because sure. Albert Finney sure. is just a good actor. He yeah. just is in the frickin' movie Annie, he was good. Yeah, He's never like, delivered a The bad man is just good. And I saw her just drop everything and go, Give me what you're gonna give me, Albert, and I'm gonna I'm gonna answer back right, in an honest right, right. way. And that takes a strong actress to be able to do that, to sure. be able to say, I've done pretty woman, I've done the, the and I'm just gonna let it all go and just listen to you. And my argument was when you, you have to be put in a safe space. And to Soderbergh realize did that. Yep. In order to cultivate that. Yeah. Steven Soderbergh is an independent film director. And, Hell and, yeah. And, and definitely cultivated that type and, of And she could have, and she, at that point in her career also, she could have just coasted. She was making um, enough money on anything she did. It, it didn't matter. But I, so I'm, I'm really interested about, so I don't want to make this an entire. Julia sure, Roberts sure, sure, podcast, sure. but there's a really interesting shift that's happening in her career around that time. And I remember there's there's a movie that my college roommates and I argued about more than any other movie ever in the history of movies. Don't know why, which was Notting Hill, oh, and and it God, was this. That movie so so there was a big argument we had. And listen, better or worse, for whatever you feel ultimately about that movie, I don't hate it as much as other people I, hate uh, it. But uh, but I remember getting into an argument with my roommate where he, he was like, hey, "She's fucking playing herself. She doesn't have to do anything." And I was like, "No, no, I don't agree with I don't agree with the you're just playing yourself bullshit. Like I don't think that that exists for the most part in most cinema a, at all. Very playing yourself is not a thing. That's it, not a thing. No, and, and it and it made me really angry. And I watch a movie like that, and I think I I would I, I'm not going to challenge anyone on this. I would say revisit that movie possibly, uh, um, and I, I'm going to say that there are there are moment there are a lot of really great fucking moments in that movie with really good act. Alec Baldwin's 
cameo as the dick. Can, they literally play I, for anyone playing themselves. Alec Baldwin is playing himself in that I, movie. And I, it's I, great. Not this way. I will <laughs> say Nine Hill is a guilty pleasure. Yes, a hundred percent correct. I, I, like that. I am. I am. But yeah, I, that, but I like, like that movie. But she is in. It, she is in a weird mix. She's got. She's got. Notting Hill, she's got Aaron Brockovich, and she's got the Mexican and America's Sweethearts. That is a wild um, fucking turn of movies pray, in two years. Love. Oh, we're not even, that's not even in that, like, she just had like a two-year run of crazy shit. It's yeah. It's unreal. But, all right. Uh, JB, did you have, you said you had another one? I do have you, another one, and, I, and I feel so. strongly about those. Okay. Oh, you guys nice. are going to think I'm being cute, but I'm not. I actually feel really strong. Is it Betty Fuckley? Right. Mm, fuck no, her. No, she was no, never no, good. No, the no, no, hey, let's bring it down. Let's, let's um, listen. We're serious about this shit. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, the TV special with the claymation. Oh, the, the, <laughs> okay. the, the, the Rankin. No, I'm being de- the, the Rankin, Rankin Bass. Yeah, Rankin the Rankin Bass. Bass. Okay. The Anne Rankin. Bass. When I was <laughs> with Anne Rankin and um, <laughs> and Lance Bass. When I was a little girl, <laughs> that was the biggest night of the year. Mm-hmm. Okay, my mom would make uh, peanut butter cookies with the Hershey Kiss in the middle, mm. and I would eat all of them during Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer. Not Rudolph's New Year. Not Rudolph's Frosty. Fr- 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 I'm talking. Rudolph the fucking red nosed reindeer. That was it for me. I loved the claymation. I loved the gay Dennis Elf. I loved <laughs> I loved Clarice. I loved the parents. I loved them all. Okay. Mm-hmm. I've come around. Okay. <laughs> Santa Claus is a motherfucker. Oh yeah. <laughs> He's an awful. He's a dick face. He is Harvey Weinstein. Okay, first of all. He doesn't eat because he wants attention. So what are you, anorexic now, you fucking fag? Okay? (laughs) He doesn't eat. All right? (laughs) His deadbeat... (laughs) His deadbeat wife is like, let me cook for you more so you get fat because you're not fat. You have to be fat. Like, what kind of enabler is that bullshit? Okay? So the motherfucker gets fat and then he's like, Look at this loser fucking reindeer with his red ass nose. What a fucking loser. Oh, and this elf is gay? Fuck him. He can't do anything. I don't want an elf that makes tools and toys for kids if he's gay. Fuck him. The kid is the kid is just trying to raise money so he can go to dental school and he happens to be a little light in his loafers. There's no reason that Santa should have been judging him, but he did. He judged Rudolph yeah. and he judged the gay elf. Yeah. And the two of them found each other because they were different. Let's not forget that Rudolph was voiced by a woman, okay? So there's all kinds of transaction going on here. The, the dentist is gay. He's trying to raise money to go to dental school. Santa's an asshole who has anorexia and now all of a sudden compulsive overeating disorder <laughs> because of his enabling wife. And then <clears throat> Santa uses Rudolph on Christmas Eve because the yeah. weather's bad and Rudolph can light the way while the gay dentist stays back in the store making toys being gay and not being allowed to and santa and his lard ass get in the freaking sleigh and the only reason he lives through the night is because of rudolph and his red nose which he never bothers to care for again because it's not stormy again on christmas eve the following year so fuck rudolph and fuck the gay elf so guess what rudolph the red-nosed reindeer is a terrible terrible christmas special that is about awful things and it's not about values and it's not about loving gay people and it's not all about loving people with weird noses like barbara streisand and i don't approve <coughs> so thanks for uh joining the new way podcast <laughs> it's it's funny actually fuck the gay elf was actually one of the stories i didn't get to on literatica um <coughs> i well, bet Wow. Uh, you know what, Jamie? Next time, don't hold back. Okay. Uh, um, I feel, um, like, feel like you were maybe holding back a little bit on this one. I, I was a little bit. But, <laughs> um, you know, when it comes to the homosexual values. You came around, though. Do you think that uh, Cornelius is like a big gay daddy? I think that Cornelius is a bear. Yeah. And I yeah. say, go gay Cornelius yeah. bear. You lick those rocks and see if there's <laughs> diamonds. You, what do you think that meant, Matt? I what do you I'll think be that honest, meant? I, as a child, I don't know why, I was very 
uh, unsettled by the the licking of the rocks in that in that show. Well, now what do you I think, think I understand meant? why. Okay, I I think I was I had latent wow. homo- homophobicy. My favorite was that one time I took a singing class with Betty Buckley, <laughs> and there was a girl in it that sang just like the doll that went. There's always tomorrow. <laughs> there was a chick in my class that sang wow. just like that. It was hot. Um. <laughs> All right, Ben. Can I stay on, <laughs> on topic? Yeah, please. Absolutely. Um, the, um, Michael McDonough film, Krampus, was a film I did not like when it came out. Same. Did you come around? We saw it together. We saw it together in here. And I did not revisit it until like two years ago when it was on, randomly on film. Is it or randomly on, And I put it on. And it is... Fantastic. Come on. Wait a minute. Come on. Yeah. I was so disappointed. No, all right. Yeah. That, I, I was not so disappointed. I just felt that it. I'm, I, I wanted I, I, more I, from I, what it I was. I am not sure what we were expecting or what we thought we were huh. going to go into. And My I mom think- has never seen Krampus. I can put this <gasps> on this week. In and, Texas. And, yeah. and the 2016 film Krampus absolutely blew my Revisit expectations, and I think it's a one of those movies I might watch every Christmas season. Wow, Ben, I, this is a huge come around. This is a big. Yeah. We we were we saw this at Frank Cinema in Del Rey with Luke with Stevens. Luke Stevens. You're hundred percent correct. Uh, I I and and it has had a phenomenal. Uh, it had a phenomenal haunted house at Halloween Horror Nights one year. Did it really? Like one of my favorite haunted houses they did there. Nice. I I am I and the cast is phenomenal. There's it, it's a it, one of the the best character actor cast put together. So um, I need so to revisit Adam, this. Adam Scott. It's uh, um, David Koechner um, and Julia Roberts. Julia <laughs> Tony, Tony Collette. Tony Collette. Oh, nice, nice. I was I, in my head. I was like, I think Tony Collette's in that, but then I'm like, that can't be right. Yeah, that's but, right. Uh, but it Tony right. Collette's in Krampus. T- Tony she Collette and I'm um, Scott play a couple. They do. Nice. Uh, yeah. It, it, it. I. I. I don't know what I, it was I, that I'm, I didn't get out of it, but no, I'm gonna uh, check it out. Well, but the irony is, oh, is Allison that, Tolman from fucking Fargo from uh, the TV. So, the, so the irony of Fargo. is, we all had the same feeling when we saw it. Yeah. And it was on a rewatch. That was just like. Holy shit. This I gotta catch that again. Then. Really? Good. And all of the effects are practical. Like, almost yeah. all the effects are, like, actual practical effects. I was like, this is really, really, really fucking impressive. And actually paced very much similar to, like, Gremlins. I remember there were a lot of Gremlins vibes, especially yeah. with the attic and the and the gingerbread uh, creatures. And I'm not sure what, what 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 happened hmm. when we saw it together, but it's damn good. I I also I'm gonna that, check it out. I totally am. I have this weird feeling that Luke liked it and we didn't, and we no, looked no, down Luke, on him. Luke was like, I uh, hate it. okay, maybe yeah. I I, I, I can't remember that one. Uh, yeah, uh, that's uh, I will I will revisit Krampus. I I wanted well, to, I, I wanted to I, watch. I, I, like I'm gonna it watch so it the next few days. So. Well, there there is also a really weird thing when you are. I, I did this with um, Jay and Silent Pop Strike Back. I was so excited for that movie, and I got to go see it at a screening after watching Kevin Smith speak in Chicago. Um, he was at like a comic, the only Comic Con I ever went to was up in Chicago, and I got to go see this early screening of it, and I hated it. Like, I, I just, I go, it's like the jokes are cheap and they're dumb and they're boring. Yeah. Oh, no. And then I, and then a week later, I saw it with a bunch of my friends here in Florida in up at the, the Jupiter Theater and loved it. And it, and then wanted to becoming one of my favorite, like, So does comedies. it depend on the crowd you're seeing? Yeah, I, I have a little, I, I, I have a little of that. It, I, I can be very susceptible to who I'm seeing it with and mm-hmm. how they're reacting to mm-hmm. it. And not always. Like, there are movies that we've had, <laughs> Ben and I will always oh, talk about Last Jedi and everyone hating it and us being like, I thought it was really good. <laughs> um, and we literally, Paul got, 
and the movie ended. <laughs> the lights came up, and Paul stood up and goes, "That's the worst movie I've ever <laughs> seen." And then Ben just tore into him. It was one of the greatest <laughs> fights I've ever ben, seen in I my love life. That. It was so great. Um, so I will say, Ben's going to use the restroom quickly here. I uh, love how you always announce when people. I, well, use I the like because I want to make sure that they understand that that I'm not monopolizing or something's going Never. on. Never. But uh, so I'm going to. I, I apologize, JB. It makes sense to do it while you're here. Okay. I'm going to talk about musicals. And I have a few, I have four musicals on my list. Oh my that God. That I I'm have, die. I have historically shit on, unapologetically so. Okay. And have come around on over time. And I, and I will say, I, I'll start with the, the biggest turn I had. Nobody cares. <laughs> no, go ahead. Go was, ahead. Um, was when I was probably in middle school, my mom showed me West Side Story. Uh, showed me the, 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 the movie, the Robert Wise film. And I was like, the Jets are fun, but the rest of this is terrible. So like, you're you're racist. I was well. I like the Sharks too. I just didn't like. I didn't give a shit about you Tony. You said and Maria. that you only like the Jets. I like the Jets said. and Sharks. I'm so sorry. I like Jets and Sharks. I like Leonard so Bernstein. So Ben, what we've score. learned is while you were in I'm the racist. bathroom, <laughs> Matt no, no. doesn't like Latino people. So. I don't. I don't. Ben, it's been a while since you knocked over things in the room. Ben, I love this. <laughs> It's my it's my happy place. No, Ben is talking about his gay musicals that he's come around on. Matt, Matt, sorry. And um, the first one was West Side Story. Oh, right. I did. So I have I have four musicals on my list of musicals. I have I have somewhat turned the corner on a little bit. I, I led with West Side because that right. was I didn't like it until I did it my senior year of high school, um, and grew an appreciation for being on stage and doing it and finding things that I liked in it. Um, and also, it's interesting, we were talking earlier, I'm not going to mention that JB is leaving to go use the restroom right now, she's not doing anything. No. Um, if she doesn't talk for the next few minutes, it's because she's a woman. Um, no, it, it, what's funny is, um, watching Beetlejuice and getting back into theater stuff, there's a thing, we were talking about whether we like watching dance or, or dance alone. Back in the day, I, I, I had no interest in watching the ensemble or dance or any of that. It always seemed like a distraction of the main oh, yeah. through line of the plot. And now watching, like watching Beetlejuice, I was... I was almost more interested in what the ensemble was doing throughout that show than I was what was going on with some of the the principals in it. Um, so West Side's always one of those shows that I I loved parts of it so much and I thought the rest of it was really boring. But I've seen other productions and I've been in productions where I've seen really interesting Tony and Maria's who I don't typically find interesting on paper. But if there's a good actor in there, and, and I think that's the wonderful thing about stage is a movie you get one shot. I mean, we do remakes and reboots here and there, but for the most part, you do a movie and that's it. Like, that's what exists for that performance. Whereas theater is great because you get to watch different interpretations constantly. They're, re they're, yeah. re they're, yeah. they're doing of revivals of things all the time. And I, that's what I love most about theater is like, I'm going to see a Tony and Maria at some performance where I'm like, oh, they're more interesting than Jess and the Sharks, which is, is very rare. That on paper, Jess and Sharks are what is interesting to me and Bernstein's score. Um, but I, I had to I put four musicals on my list. West Side was the big one. Les Mis was one. I, I had no interest in Les Mis for years and years and years. I saw the movie. I liked the well, movie. Well, that's your thought problem. I know. Fuck I you. know. I liked the movie. <laughs> But when you gave us tickets to go see uh, that live performance of Les Mis at Kravis, that was the first time where I really was like, oh, I really enjoy this. Like, I, like not just a little bit, I really enjoy it. Uh, JB's attempt to go under the mic instead of just turning the mic out is kind of amazing here. I'm just watching you get back into... We were talking about how great Les Mis is, JB. I know you. it's one of your favorites. It's so funny because your nieces, when we did the podcast with your nieces, they threw these microphones all over the room, <laughs> and I'm so afraid to touch them. No, you, you could have moved that one. It's fine. But yeah, Les Mis was on there. Rent is another one. We talked about Rent uh, this year uh, and last year, where I still think, though, Tick, Tick, Boom is far superior to Rent in literally every single way, and I watch Tick, Tick, Boom a thousand times before I watch Rent again. But Rent is fine. And the last one, Ben. Sure it is. The last one is uh, Oklahoma. How do you feel about that, Ben? How do you yeah. feel about that, JB? <laughs> 
through uh, nothing uh, good I'm about sorry. Oklahoma. There's nothing good about it. Nothing? I don't mean the state. I nothing? just mean the musical. <laughs> I, I, I dislike the state more than the musical. I'll put it that way. I, uh, Maddie, no, no. you okay. are doing what an actor should do. Yes. Fuck which off. is I'm when you're, the when you're in the Oklahoma. show... You should like the material That's whether right. you like it or not. You should it's like fantastic. it. It's fantastic. I just so, I finished reading the play that is based on Green Grow the Lilacs. Uh, I learned a little bit more about Aunt Eller and uh, and the peddler. You know, I think I think you guys are not. I think you're missing what they were what they're saying about that time period. What's it called when you begin to identify with your kidnapper? Uh, uh, Stockholm Mon- Syndrome. Stockholm, yeah, that's what matters. Or Munchausen <laughs> by proxy. Munchausen by proxy. <laughs> that's when you guys start feeling my pain. <laughs> Did you say Munchausen <laughs> by proxy? <laughs> he started it, <laughs> I knew where he was going. <laughs> but, the irony is, I think this entire podcast yes. is Stockholm <laughs> Syndrome <laughs> and Munchausen by proxy. Both of them are. I, yeah. I literally put on my sheet, I just put Oklahoma and then watch the world burn <laughs> in parentheses. Matt, there's oh, just, there just fun. isn't anything you can say that's going to make that good. It, it's just not. I'm sorry. I play an old man that's in a love triangle with two people that might be it's 18. I show. think that's fantastic. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. So anyway. <laughs> anyway, continuing on. Uh, I, I'm trying to... I, so I... I JB, you talked about um, Julia Roberts, and I, I, I think actresses and actors are really big on my list of people that I, I've had an unfair dislike for, and and there's one, and this oh, is not. I, um, I'm interested in getting into this. These are not, you have a lot. I do. I and this one is one I don't think we have ever talked about um, on air or off air at all. But this was a this was a, an actor that was very polarizing for me that I have I have turned so far the corner on, and it's Zachary Quinto. And I uh, what. I I okay. first became aware of him on 24 because I watched that show religiously and he played this terrible fucking annoying character on it. And then his big breakout was Heroes, which was another show I religiously watched. And I thought he was so basic in his like villain turn on that show. And I thought it was so dumb so that when he was announced as Spock in Star Trek, I was like, fuck this. Like, he sucks. Like, I legitimately just felt he was a shitty, terrible actor. And then Star Trek was kind of the jumping off point where I was like, okay, like, this is someone who's actually putting in the time and I think is good. And I've watched him subsequently in things where I think he is a far better actor than I gave him credit for at the start. Yeah, I get what you say about... What did you say about his vil- that it was basic? I I remember seeing that in was, American yeah. Horror Story. Yes, he he was very he was playing all the basic tropes of a, you know, and even on Oz, he wasn't playing a villain, but he, he I don't know, he was playing a prisoner, right? So he was playing a bad guy, and I get what you mean. Like he falls into those like typical trap. The tra- traps of uh, playing a bad guy. He he can be bad, but there. But when I see him like show up, and and I, and it doesn't necessarily mean he's a good actor. He needs to like figure out how to make bad parts good. Uh, is well, that's like when you become Gary Oldman and you do everything you do is fucking yeah. watchable and amazing, it, and totally. you never phone it in, right? Even when you're phoning it in. Um, but yeah, I I think there are times you watch actors when they're like where they're finally being stretched or tested, or they they have a good director or whatever it is. Um, it is interesting, and I have like a huge list of of these uh, of, of things that fall into that trope. But I also have a list of people that I just I didn't like for whatever reason, and they're probably not great actors. But I also find that or there's people you don't like. There, there are <laughs> like so Ryan Philippe is on my list. I th- I someone I used you to, don't like. I would tell him he was a terrible fucking actor. I didn't like him. I didn't want to watch anything he did. 
and then he did MacGruber. <laughs> and then I listened to interviews with them. As, I, I, and Howard Stern's responsible for at least like five of my star turns on my list, uh, including Lady Gaga, where I well, listened well, to interviews that's a, with someone. That's a warning sign right there. It is 100% a warning sign. But the fact that I listened to them actually have a conversation. He does make you like people. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's more yeah. of understanding. Like, I remember Ryan Philippe was really interesting to me. He his, was very cool on the Stern show. And his, his story was literally like talking about auditioning for Captain America and thinking he had it, like thinking this was it, like this was his his big break back into acting and he was going to be part of this Marvel franchise and then he gets doesn't get it and his career, and then he winds up in MacGruber, which is, I love that movie. It's not a, an MCU movie. Um, I, I do feel for the, I am very susceptible to the human side of absolutely, performers. Absolutely, absolutely. And if, they're, if they seem like they're a decent person in general or they're or or they're at least putting in the work and they're trying and they're not just kind of coasting uh, on shit that uh, means a lot to unless me. they're josh hartnett fuck josh hartnett he sucks and everyone thinking he is the josh hartnett re, re, like the it's the reconnaissance and hey, oppenheimer is the heart renaissance come on <laughs> the heart nessence <laughs> no i will i will not no he's terrible he's still terrible <laughs> He's been good in exactly two things, and uh, and I won't so, name them because Matt <laughs> just regressed like two hundred episodes. We don't know that Josh Hartnett is nice or puts in the work. You just like him. Actually, I know him. <gasps> and, no, I'm just kidding. Oh no, my brother, my brother and Ben are like Josh's big defenders am, for me. <laughs> I have heard that he's great to work. <sighs> Fine. Who's he married? Is he married to anybody famous? Can they vouch for him? I was best friends with someone who broke up with him. So. <laughs> Amazing. Benny, who do you have on your list of like, who are, I, we don't talk a lot about like people you vehemently dislike or that you maybe have turned the corner on. You're maybe the other way that you've soured on people? Well, <laughs> there's, Hunter, Hunter there's, a reason, there's a reason. <laughs> um, People are, are people and name. People, uh, so here's my thing. I have one. Hmm. And it falls into the cancel culture mm -hmm. okay. thing. Mm -hmm. Didn't um, age well. I'm, I always try and, maybe I'm an eternal optimist. I try and give people the benefit of the doubt or whatever. But, um, There was one person I really liked following um, and liked their career trajectory tra um, that I became really sad about later, uh, which is Max Landis. Hmm. Um, and mostly because I really loved what he wrote for yeah. a couple of films. Um Max Landis was the son of John Landis. And, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Who also has a polarizing history. Yeah. Yeah. Which is um, crazy. And and Max had a very public forum. He was on YouTube and all these other okay. forums. And was... And when, like, critique movies that were out there, uh, you know, in the, um, in the day. But... Um, I I was I was convinced that Mac Lan Max Landis after Chronicle and a couple Chronicle of other things was phenomenally good. He wrote and uh, everyone involved in Chronicle ended up just fucking and we're imploding. like we're like wow like, this is the next guy like this is the guy like he has and he pinched Pan like like the whole Peter Pan movie they did but. Could change so much. Yeah, he pinched that. That was his pinch about, about doing. Oh no, no, it's a prequel. This is and the then, one with the one and, with Hugh Jackman. And, and then you realize yeah. that that's Black Mirror, and this is yeah, 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 whatever. He pinched that. He pinched that way before. Um, and, Pretty brilliant. And I, I was I I would watch his like the way he pinched films. I was I was like. This guy's fucking used amazing. Used to be all over Red Letter Media stuff, too. With yeah. like the, yeah. Yeah, it was all over everything. I was like, ooh, wow, this guy's amazing. And uh, the guy's a fucking douchebag. 
I have fun. I don't know much about. I, I'll be honest. I don't know much about what what transpired with him in well, general. I mean, Wright was his biggest paycheck. Yeah. Um, and Wright was a fucking terrible movie, in my opinion. That so, was the one that was produced by uh, uh, Gunn, right? Oh no 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 Brian! Oh no no that was the one that Nick loved. <laughs> yeah, no <laughs> I did. I so sorry to throw Nick under the uh, under the bus with this. I so I remember very distinctly. I was <laughs> this was it was like five years ago to the date yeah. almost because I was in Bandera. I was uh, I was out in Texas for Christmas, and Bright came out on Netflix, and, and Nick and, and Nick was, was like, and Nick saying. was like, "This is this movie is great," and Ben was like, "This is the worst movie." I uh, by the way have no, never no, watched Bright. No, no to this I, point. I, I I was appalled. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was I was it was so fucking racially insensitive and, and, and so fucking terror. I was like, "Oh my fucking god." This movie fucking sucks. Right, right. It, this is the I. I'm gonna say this in in all honesty. This is one of maybe like three times in our professional lives together that Ben went off of a group chat with Nick and me to message me privately wow. and be like, "What the fuck?" And yeah. that, and that the, we've been through way worse things than Bright. That we have not like negated, it necessitated us doing that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, I, I was kind of like, oh, okay, like this is this is really interesting to me. No, I, and I, then I never watched it. I always kind of felt like I, at some point, I should to like kind of meter the yeah. the, so, so the right, argument. Right, but. right after that movie came out, um, <laughs> it came out that he got canceled. Basically. Okay. Yeah, sure. And um, uh, but I had like thought he was like the next thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like the next voice. Mm-hmm. I was like, well, I was totally wrong. I wasn't totally wrong because he was an asshole. Because, like, the next three things he produced... Were shit. Were absolute fucking dogs. Yeah. 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 I think it's... I think... It's an age-old story of do you love the artist or do you love the artist's work? And I think a lot of times it catches up with the artist that their work starts to reflect who they yeah. are. And so you don't have that problem anymore. You know, That's a great point. I, I, I 100% mm-hmm. believe that. And, mm-hmm. I, and I think it, like, it, it also is really interesting. I, I had no doubt about this going into the podcast, but it, it, it was proved on this that we also... Um, the three of us very much are are. It is hard for us to remove our emotions and our personality from the people and the idea of a personal connection with that person. So even if we're gonna shit on somebody, like at some point of it, we're like, well, but maybe they're nice or maybe they're whatever. Or and it doesn't and that doesn't excuse shitty work either. I I think that all of the people involved on the acting side of Big Bang Theory are phenomenal actors. I think it's the worst written and most terrible disgusting awful shitty show that has ever existed and it like and it's funny it'll show up on there's some show i watch where it's like playing on i think i'm watching like american dad and it's i i catch the last 10 seconds or 30 seconds of the episode on the dvr for it and every time i'm watching 10 really good fucking actors deliver fuck just shit and i and i want to just a, like uniformly dismiss that show as garbage, but it's hard for me to do that when I'm like these people. Like this was a paycheck for them for for years. It made their entire lives, their their livelihood. Like they don't have to work again because of this show. And most of them probably didn't even phone it in as shitty as it was. So it it, it's, it is hard for me to always reconcile that weird little kind of dichotomy mm-hmm. of things. Mm-hmm. But well, uh, also uh-oh. Matt, you're not a professional actor like I the am person not across a, from me. I am not, <laughs> no, I don't have any Broadway or two national tour credits to my my bill. I was Sorry, in a failed production of the producers like. with Entract that never opened. As was I. I yes. Yes, but you have other things to fall back on. That's still one credit I have to put on my resume. No, I think I th- you know as much as we like to joke about the the whore that Betty Buckley is, um, that that was a that was a prime example of Ben. I gotta tell you something. 
she could have just shat all over me and treated me like shit for th- three hours in class one night. And then I would go see her perform. <coughs> and, and she'd sing one song and I'd be like, God damn it. it like, how how does the universe or whatever share, whoever it is up there, <laughs> bestow <laughs> these gifts on these people who act like that in their life, you know? Um, but as is the case with the director you just mentioned or the the writer you just mentioned, I think eventually it catches up and the two meet each other and the shitty work meets the shitty person, you know, and the work is just shit. And, um, and, but then sometimes they, but like Betty's a great example and it's such a niche little genre, but it's, it's becoming more and more. I I think we can blame, I'm going to blame Tarantino for it, but there's a thing that happens where people are really, they're big and they're really shitty and difficult to work with, and right. they get phased out of Hollywood. And then, then somebody who doesn't know about all the shitty behavior <laughs> that like enjoyed them as a child sponsors them. M Night Shyamalan's like fucking put Betty Buckley in Split and let's like yeah. kill her with like uh, let's have James McAvoy kill her and it's gonna be great. Yeah, yeah. And now she's in all of this shit that yeah. he's doing, and like and Tarantino did it with like Travolta. I'm sure Travolta was shitty to work with. Back in the day, like there's no reason his career should have failed as much as it did, and he's just like I fucking like Saturday Night Fever, throw him in Pulp Fiction. Well, that's, that's why there will choice. always be that age old thing of should I love the the perform yeah. the performance or the performer, you know? Well, and our next podcast will be: Is anyone actually capable of atonement? Has anyone actually worked their way out of it and become a better person? Than Certainly the other side? not Betty Buckley. Certainly not John Travolta. <laughs> Certainly not Tom Cruise. Certainly, well, no, I say that. <laughs> so out of my mouth. Yeah, we, we've got a lot of people that don't meet I that would one. say Brad Pitt has done a pretty good fucking show. I wouldn't disagree with you on that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that he ever, like, got drummed out for being a dick. He, he got drummed got... out for being married to that whore. Yeah. That whore I'm very muckling. Wait, which whore? I'm not saying her name because I called her a whore, so now I'm scared. Could be there are several whores involved. We don't really know which one you might be talking about. One he married. He married. Oh, okay. (laughs) I'm I'm sure she's lovely. (laughs) There's there's only one truth. There's only one truth. And this is what we say on the humor podcast. Whenever we say whore, it equals Betty. Uh, that's right. It's so that she stands. She is representative of all whores. Exactly. She is all whores. In 1991, Ron Pitt married Penny Buckley. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> on that note, Penny Buckley's we, phone they, number is 917. Uh, <laughs> and they were together until 2001 when they broke up on ceremony. That's like, right. And then. <laughs> do you know? Do you know why I, this is okay? Listen, guys, I no, no, no. <laughs> Brad Pitt was really distraught. In two thousand four, he got back together with Penny Buckley. Yes, <laughs> but but what people don't listen, people are not talking about this enough. You, Betty Buckley dropped his ass in two thousand one for one reason. It's fucking shitty. It's because he did a movie called The Mexican, and she hates Mexicans. Oh. Betty, she if there's Mexican. one thing JB can tell us about Betty Buckley, is she Maddie, hates did I tell Mexicans. You, did I tell you what she does to Mexicans? <laughs> Have I told you about that? <laughs> no, that's true. She's she <laughs> she literally hires Mexicans to to get the poop out of her yard from her five dogs, and she pays them. She lives on a ranch, and she pays them ten dollars. To remove all the shit from her whole entire ranch. Ten bucks. And she calls them my Mexicans. <laughs> Anyone who's listening to this, please please write to BettyBuckley.com <laughs> and share the story that I'm sharing. Oh my God, I'm dead. Also, I'm dead. Uh, unrelated, I'm dead. Uh, Last Pine Productions uh, is going into production on our screenplay, uh, Betty Buckley Hates Mexicans. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, we, we will be producing this. Uh, I think that year. cease and desist is coming, Matt. I'm just going to say. Pedro Pascal is no. going to break your heart in there. Uh, it's going to be amazing. I'm going to that's going to be uh, called The Mexicans. <laughs> Well, on that note, I, I think we, I think as Howard Stern says, we've said it all. Uh, yes. We've said too much. Uh, we want to thank you for tuning in to the New Wave podcast. This is our last podcast of the year, or is it? 
we may be trying to sneakily record another podcast Ooh. around a mutual set of birthdays while Ben is off gallivanting Ooh. in Hilton Head. Uh, but there may be a surprise podcast. It's all whether or not we can actually get Elizabeth to show up. Happy um, holidays. But we'll see. We're going to find out. If not... We'll, we'll talk to you in the new year with all kinds of great things planned. I didn't even get to the Christmas gifts. Uh, JB, you have a Christmas gift sitting right at your feet. Oh, my God. I was going to do this on air, but I think it's better off air anyway. Okay. Uh, but we will, we, we'll talk about it the next time we're on. Well, thank you so much for listening to the New Way Podcast, and we'll talk to you next time. Cheers. Cheers. Come by.